Welcome to our LA County Library Virtual Event, Creative Career Path. I'm Caroline Chang, Arts Program Manager at LA County Library, and I will be your host today. And in today's program, uh, today's program is a part of a series exploring careers in entertainment, film, TV, and the me media industries. So today, director and producer Kimberly Browning will have a conversation with commercial director Elizabeth Littman. So, uh, to get started, um, I'm going to introduce our presenters today uh, while reading their bios. Um, I did announce this at the beginning, for, but for those of you who joined, while I'm reading their bios, if you want to introduce yourself to us in the chat, please, uh, we'd love to hear from you and to hear a little bit of more about, you know, where you are in your creative journey and what you're hoping to learn out of today to help us kind of uh, know what you want to hear here today. Um, so first, uh, to kick it off, um, Kimberly Browning is a filmmaker based in LA and as founder and festival director of the Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, which launched in 1988. She is an associate film programmer at Tribeca Film Festival and a senior programmer at Catalyst Content Festival. She's been the executive producer of HBO Access since 2015 and is now part of the new Warner Media Access Programs team developing emerging writers and directors in episodic television. And our guest speaker today, Elizabeth Lippman, is a multi-award winning New York and LA based director and portrait, fashion and lifestyle photographer. She is co-creator of the Life as a Runway column in the New York Times and the Power of Beauty video series on Allure. And she was a finalist and participant in the AICP's and DGA's 2019 Commercial Directors <laughs> Diversity Program. In so many letters. Right? Yeah, a lot of acronyms. <laughs> in 2010, she and her cinematographer partner launched Three Dog Pack Pictures, a photographer director DP collective. And Elizabeth likes to make smart content for smart women. Her work is emotionally authentic and immersive with a bent towards female empowerment. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kimberly to start our conversation off. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again here. Um, we're so excited to talk about the career path of a commercial director. And Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm we're thrilled so happy to, to be here to share your your creative journey and and the steps that you took to make your passion your career. Um, so I'd love, to, yeah. So you know. If you want to, if there's a way to describe what is the job of a commercial director, I think a lot of people um, think a lot of, when they think about film directing, they think about film or episodic television. And there's this mm -hmm. entire world that um, with branded content and TikTok, you know, being a commercial director has expanded so much. So I want to talk about, you know, what is the job? What's the, what's the, uh, what is expected of you as a commercial director? And then we'll go and kind of talk about your steps and your journey getting there. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is very exciting. It's interesting. The, the whole concept of being a commercial director is shifting as the entire commercial industry is shifting. You know, for a long time, I grew up like everyone else watching commercials and my parents were like, that's junk. And they would mute it and they didn't want to see it. And I was aware even from an early age that uh, commercials sort of created desire for things that you might not have known existed. Like my kids don't watch TV. So when I ask them what they want for Christmas, they're like, they don't even know what toys are out there right there because they don't have things advertised at them all the time. But if you look around our world, every street you walk on, every bus stop, every everything, there are messages that are being sent to you, whether you like it or not. And so my whole take on it has been to expand what I was already doing. And basically, if there's going to be messages getting out there, I'm going to try and make them as woman forward as I can. I'm going to try and you know, shift the story so you don't see the same old crap over and over again and you see like a different perspective on things. I'm really actively interested in and involved in other kinds of people's stories. I love the shifts that are going on in pop culture where now people realize that like, you know, Barbie is not the only toy and neither is that the only lifestyle. That's not the only aspiration to have. So for me, commercial directing is, um, it's, it's Commercials and commercial directing basically drive entertainment in one way or another. Um, a lot of people that you like and admire as creators have made a living and supported themselves doing commercial types of work and they can get paid over here to make that commercial and then they can turn that money into support while they make their passion project, which is the thing that you then go to a festival to see or see in a movie or becomes a TV show or becomes a diverse project that's interesting. I mean, it's it sort of drives our economy forward. And so as artists, as artists, you can tap into that. And I think that's really, um, a, a smart thing to do to to find that's a way smart. to tap into 
your passion and finding a way to support yourself so that you can then go make your art in another way. Let's talk about practical the elements of the yeah. job actually is. Okay. So um, once I connected with the way it works, which was somewhat recent, like about five years ago, basically the way it works for the most part in actual commercial stuff is um, uh, a brand hires an agency. The agency helps them craft their message, whatever that's going to be. And it could be an immersive thing. It could be a straight up commercial. It could be a, a mini series of branded spots that you see on TikTok. It could be all kinds of stuff. They will decide what that message is and what the overall thing is they want to make. They will send out an RFP, which is a request for production. Uh, I guess I don't know if you can help. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they send it out to all of their partners, which gets to all different kinds of production companies. And the production companies will basically pitch themselves and say, we have this director that we think would work really well with this project for this reason. And then they will send out a reel and your reel is cut together from other work that you've done. And like, I'm not on the roster with anyone. I'm freelance, which is another whole thing. A lot of people are still working as freelance these days because you got a lot of freedom and you don't get pigeonholed as much and you can work on all different kinds of projects. Um, so, but whether you're on a roster or not, usually the typical way this works, the traditional way it goes to a production company and it puts together a package and says, here's our reel. And then the company, the, the brand, the advertiser and their agency will pick somewhere between companies and directors to bid. And then they will talk with them, have an in-depth conversation about where they want to go, what this project is supposed to be, what they're trying to do. And then the director working with the production company puts together a treatment. And the treatment is, I find them to be pretty elaborate. They'll always tell you they don't need to be more than 30 pages, but they end up being a lot more than that. And they become, as, as, com as commercial directing has become more competitive, they've become a little bit more intense. Like people put in music and songs and hand-drawn things and references and gifts are really popular in there right now. And you're putting together your vision for how you would make this commercial. And it's taking a piece of you and a piece of the brand and uh, visual references that you want to share. And you are basically saying, if I get this job, this is how I'm going to take your budget. And this is what I'm going to make. And this is how I'm going to make it. And you're competing against three to five to eight other people who have maybe very different visions. Sometimes it's really cut and dried and you're like, how am I going to jazz this up and make it seem interesting? And it's this whole process that you can learn. And we'll share resources with you guys about, you know, ways that you can get better at this. If you get to age, um, you basically you get make a, a getting the, when you get awarded the job, what's, uh, talk a little bit about boarding, talk a little bit about what is expected of you as the director. And okay. how, so once you get the award, um, Great. Um, once you get the award, then the project is yours and it becomes all about your creative vision and how you are going. It's a combination of what's in your brain and your amazing ideas that you have and then how the hell you're going to make this happen. Okay. So if you've pitched something that's like on Mars in a futuristic year, you have to, you have to literally put down, you're responsible for basically overseeing everything from that point on the casting. You'll decide who's in it. You'll decide if they're real people or actors, what do they look like? What do they sound like? What, what are they, what, what are they doing? You know, everything, the script is usually the script comes from them, but you can hone it. You can make a lot of changes or a few changes. You can definitely put your stamp on it. You are choosing the color palette, what everything looks like. You're choosing the cinematographer and the cinematographer and you together are choosing everything from what this world looks like that you're building is it a warm what is it a cool world is it washed out is it intense is it punchy colors is it all like is it really fast cut and jumpy or is it dream like all of that everything every piece of that is coming from inside your brain and you'll have an incredible team that you'll work with. it's definitely not like you're physically doing it all yourself but it's all coming from your vision and you will be responsible for working with the client making sure they understand what you're doing making sure this is one of the most challenging things. You have to basically get them what they want, but you have to get them what you want to. You have to make it better. Like they're gonna have a vision that's possibly really detailed, often not. They'll have a vague idea of what they want. So you have to sell it to them first, but you also have to make sure that you're getting something you wanna make. And you know, you can turn in 
something that's exactly what they said they want, like a person standing on a seamless talking to the camera, if that's what you want. But, but if you're smart, you'll take their budget and the resources that you're gonna have at your disposal and you'll make something that you really wanna make, that you can make work that you're passionate about that happens to be commercial. You can make work that is beautiful, that pushes the envelope, that tries a new style of cinematography, that, that makes people fly through the air with a new technology that's just starting to be used. Like you should use your world everything you know, everything you've learned up to that point and put it in there and make it as great as it can be. Because at the end of the day, they're going to sign off on something that sells their product or that is, you know, the fulfillment of what they think, but it can be so much more than that. And that's where it comes down to you to make it as good as you possibly can. So how so long is, if you have an agenda, how long is a normal commercial shoot? How involved are you in the post process? Um, and talk a little bit about, you know, there's a unique thing that happens in commercial that's a bit more, I'll use the diplomatic word of collaborative. Uh, there's normally okay. more decision makers in the creative process in the commercial world. Can you talk about the logistics of as a director, what's your role, how, a little bit more about um, mm -hmm. what the what the workflow is like a little bit. Yeah, and I will say something that's great about commercial stuff is you, it, it, more than, for example, in episodic television, it really comes down to the director. Like episodic television, it's a lot about the showrunner and the producers and, people, and the actors who've been there for 10 seasons already and all that. As a commercial director, you have a lot of control over what's happening. Um, that's wonderful and stressful. The workflow is, like the time frame is, it's at least a month, you know, from start to finish. You start doing the calls, then you get the award, then you jump into pre-production and you're, you know, you're bringing on your team, you're bringing on your art department people and your casting people and your DP and you're pulling together everyone who's going to work together to make this. Um, if you're, you will take, you, if you're lucky, you'll have a core group of people that you work with as often as possible. And when they're not available, they'll recommend people and you start to build up this Rolodex of trusted people. Like someone, I need someone who can build who can take one studio space and make it look like nine different industrial workspaces for not a lot of money. That's intense. I found a woman who does that. Now I call her first for every single one of my jobs. I want her as the head of my art department for everything. You know what I mean? You build your team of people you trust who will listen to you and collaborate with you. They make you better. They suggest so things that you hadn't thought of. Maybe. So maybe two. Let's talk about what? Like maybe two oh, weeks crap. from more script to cat like to. So pre pro well, how long? It's more and then how from long award shoot? from award to shoot is usually at least two weeks. Yeah. Um you really want you really want like three or four if possible. The yeah. shortest I've ever done the shortest I've ever done it from award to shoot was eight days or nine days and it was getting it was really stressful. <laughs> and then about how long is it? you know, shoots can be three to five days a little bit. And mm -hmm. then yep. talk a little bit about how much you're involved in the post process and how that in the post. Yeah. And how that that varies a lot. Uh, the, the different the shoots are, are in the approval process involved. Okay. So the shoots are like, they're really like anywhere from one to five days. The longest I've done is three. Um, unless it's multi location, sometimes you're flying around, like sometimes one of your things is in one city and one is in another city. And then you're sort of in this deep process. You're full on with this project only for at least two weeks. Like, the, you know, you're in constant meetings, you're doing the wardrobe and you're doing, you're having meetings with the client and you're tightening up the script and you're rewriting things and all that kind of stuff. Then you shoot, which is the funnest part of the whole thing. Like you spend all this time in pre-pro and you make a million decisions and all of that feels just like, like, I want to get there. I want to get there. I want to get there. You want to get to the shoot day. And then once you get to the shoot day, it's actually relatively easy. You've made so many decisions already. You've put so many things in place. Every decision you've made has a trickle down effect to other decisions. So by the time you walk onto the set, that part's like a party. It's like a piece for me, at least it's fun. It's like, it's, definitely something always goes wrong. Lots of things go wrong. You have to pivot really quickly. You have to trust your partners. You have to be able to like crack the whip when necessary. And you're the leader. Everyone looks to you. Like if you don't make your day, even if it's a hundred percent, not your fault, it still comes down on you. Like it's a lot of pressure. You have to make your day, but it's also really fun. When you wrap the shoot, now this is, there's a huge range. There are jobs where I've wrapped the shoot. We hand off the film and we walk away and I don't see it again until they send me the finished product that's less work and you don't get paid for all that work. Like it's all just part of your deal, but you want to be involved if you can. I mean, you want to at least, very least, you want to know who the edit house is, who the editor is, get introduced to them and share your vision with them. A lot of commercial mm -hmm. directors used to be editors. 
and a lot of them will do a director's cut right away like the night of the shoot they will do their own and i don't have any editing experience so i don't have that advantage but i know a lot of commercial directors who are successful who do that they get on the plane or whatever and on the plane they're throwing together their own edit from their favorite tapes and they send that to the client and a lot of times the client takes that they take like a big portion of that and they're like oh you're right and that's an awesome way to do it if you can to put up what you think is the right way for this work to be displayed you know um there are there are choices to be made afterwards that are really important what does it sound like what's the music how many sound effects do you use are you is it voiceover or not voiceover i just had a job in june where they kept me involved in the post process and i 100 percent fought for what i thought the voice should be in this particular case i thought it was so important that the voice have just the right amount of like maturity and and depth and you had to like want to listen to them and the, the the editors sent me a bunch of like vocal fry white college girl voices like am i god like this is my no offense to any of you who happen to speak like that that's your choice but for my commercial that was not the right sound they sent me 30 voices that all sounded like college girls and i was like nope that is not what i'm going for and i had to go back and find the one voice out of 80 people they called into the initial audition i was like don't send me your selects i don't want your selects you're wrong send me all of them and i went back and i found the voice that i wanted and it was like it was what i consider like the maya angelou voice like you want to listen to her you want to take the wisdom from her it happened to also be a middle-aged woman of color who i'm always going to happily employ over you know some whatever millennial sounds like everybody else it was like exactly the right voice for the project tracked her down fought for her had her come in twice you know got and got her on the job and it and it had such a massive effect on the final project it sounds so much better with this voice so if you're lucky you'll get to be involved um all the way through post-production takes a long time i have a client that just signed off on friday on the final version of a spot that was supposed to be wrapped up three weeks ago I'm, again, I'm not getting paid for any of it. You get paid for your shoot days and that's it. You don't get paid a penny more than that, but you want, want to be involved, fight for your project. You want to make it as good as it can be. Um, you know, again, you only have moderate control over what happens to it. You'll know going into it if you're making a television commercial or if you're making an online content piece. Um, but sometimes there are pleasant surprises like eight months after I, or six months after I did a, ups docu spot that wasn't a lot of money i found out that they had applied for a bunch of awards for us and that we had won the semifinals and we were up to finals and a bunch of things and i didn't even know that the that the um agency had submitted us until we got to that point they were like oh we didn't want to get you excited there's thousands of entries thousands and thousands and and then i was like totally involved at that point and um and we ended up winning a webby award and a couple of addy awards which is yeah. a big deal in the industry i i didn't know but so let's talk about um your journey you know what was your exposure to art uh how did your exposure to an artistic voice start and what was the first step when you you know how did commercial directing become an option how did you learn about it and just i really want to streamline action items that somebody can take on sure and hearing about how you created your own opportunity did you go to film school did you start as a photographer and then really talk very succinctly about um, when commercial directing came to you and how you were able to open the door to move into that space. Okay, and briefly, I started as a photographer. I was a news photographer, and then I moved into fashion and portraits. And so I did was you happy start doing in that. high school or college? I started in college. I started in college. I went was to the University of Michigan. School? No, they didn't have a journalism program at my school, but we I went to University of Michigan, and we had one of the best independent college newspapers in the country. They don't take funding from the school, so they write real stories about about shitty professors and about, um, sorry about my language, and about, um, you know, problems with admissions and things like that. They broke stories that were big stories because they weren't getting funded by the school, so they could do a real investigative work. I happened to be there also when we had very good sports teams, national championship winning sports teams. And I was able to go spend my weekends photographing the football and basketball games and getting my stuff published. And my editor at the time was a fifth year senior and he was freelancing for the Associated Press and he was making money. He was making like $150 per shift with the Associated Press, which in 1994 was a decent amount of money. He could move out, he could pay his rent. He was supporting himself as a freelance photographer. And that was the first time I got the idea that this was doable, that you didn't have to go to war to like, you know, put your body and life at risk to make a name for yourself. You could start stringing where you are. You could start working for a local new 
there aren't a lot of local newspapers anymore, but there were at the time, every single town had a local newspaper and some of them were award winning. Some of them had great photography staff. So I started there doing that kind of stuff. I did an internship in Europe instead of just going on like, did you have him endorse yes. you? Did you have oh, oh, he a relationship? Got so it was a relationship that helped you take that first step. Yes. And there are unusual ways that he helped me. Sometimes it was little things like just and the Associated Press would have extra lenses and you need a long lens to shoot football. I didn't have a 300 millimeter lens, so I was able to borrow one from the Associated Press. Like I asked people, we went to, there were there were like monthly meetings of the local, um, there's like the National Press Photographers Association and then each state has their own. There's like, you know, versions of that. Mm -hmm. And we would go to these meetings and I would meet other news photographers who whose names I had seen in all the local newspapers, like the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News. And they would show up at these meetings and they took an interest in a young female who was trying to, you know, do this job. They lent me extra passes. There'd be um, the, my paper, my school paper would only have two passes to the football games and the big editors took those passes and the junior photographers didn't get them. But my friend at the AP would snag an extra pass and make sure I was able to get access to the guy, to the field. And, you know, it's, it's a lot about hustling. It's a lot about asking, ask people for help, tell people what you want to do. Say, I'm really interested in this. Is there, do you know anyone who can help me with this? I've had people reach out to me on next door and say, I see that you're a photographer. My kid wants to study photography. Can he come intern for you for a weekend? And I'm like, yes, you can. People will help. They really will. Especially if you're, you know, in any kind of category of people, young, uh, female, you know, if you're, if you're any kind of group or you identify with any kind of group, ask people in that group to help you. They really will. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did an internship program in Europe instead of just going and studying and like, you know, drinking away my junior year. I did an internship program where we didn't get paid, but we got amazing internships. And I worked in London for the press association there, which is like their associated press. It's their national news source. And I was covering national news stories. I wasn't getting paid. I ended up getting the cover of Hello Magazine, which is like their people magazine. And the the my big editors were all these old British dudes and they took me out to lunch and they bought me presents and they were like, you got the cover of like the big, it was like getting people magazine at 19 years old. And then, and then I came back and I found what a listing. Was? What was it was a photograph. It was a photograph of Daniel Day Lewis arriving to the funeral of his manager. He had been living as a recluse and he had been retired for a couple of years. And I had just recently seen, um, Last of the Mohicans again, and he had long hair and that, and remember, he was very swoony in that movie. And he had been living as a recluse and he showed up at this thing and he came in the back door. All the other photographers were at the front door. And the senior photographer that I was there with was like, you go cover the back door, I'm taking this spot. And I was like, okay. So I went around back and I was the only person back there. It was pouring rain, I'm 19 years old. Everyone's treated me like garbage. And I'm the only one who was there. And I saw this long haired, mopey looking dude walking up. And I was like, oh my God, that's the guy. And I took a couple of pictures and I'm the only one who got it. It was like, you know, they shoved me in the back and told me to be quiet and I got the picture. So pay attention. And right. you know, you never know, you never know where those opportunities are going to come from. That's right. So, um, from there, I, I, I found a listing of, um, and this stuff is all online now, but this was before online. I found a listing of, um, people who, I guess like editors in New York who were from Michigan, which is so random, but I was at school in Michigan at the time. And I wrote them all letters, like actual letters. And I said, hi, I'm coming to New York and I'm going to be, in, I'm going to be living there and I'm looking for opportunities. And a guy who ran a fashion studio who had like all the catalogs back in the day, your Macy's catalog and your famous bar catalog, 90% of the catalog work came through his studio. He was from Michigan. Um, he turned out to be a lech among other things. And there will be those two, I'm just warning you, but you know, he gave me a job and I worked there all summer and he paid me like $400 a week, which I could live off of at the time I was living for free with a friend of my parents on their couch. You know, you do what you have to do. You know, I was eating, um, ramen and doing what you have to do to get the job that you want, the dream job. Long story short, I worked, I came, I moved to New York as soon as I graduated college and I went in and asked for meetings everywhere I could. And again, there was an editor from uh, the New York Times who was from Michigan and he agreed to meet with me and he saw my book of news and sports photography um, and introduced me to the sports editor who was an old white guy who basically said I could never let, I could never hire a girl to shoot sports teams at the New York Times. The other photographers wouldn't stand for it. Why don't you go talk to the ladies section? The ladies section meant like, you know, styles and stuff like that. I wasn't interested in that. 
but I did start working on the weekends doing news for them because their staffers didn't want to work on the weekends. So I started doing that almost every weekend, covering for other people and, and said yes making, to a side. Uh, yeah. Even though oh. you were going for a very specific thing, even though they said no, you still found a way to get into that group. 100%. If you're going to tell me I can't shoot sports for you, I'm going to shoot something else for you. You know, you can pivot. You have to pivot. You have to be ready to pivot. And keep in mind what you will and won't do. And be honest with yourself. Like, I wasn't interested at that time in getting shoved off. But eventually, later on, I found my way back to the style section. And it wasn't the yeah, ladies section. It was, it, which is really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Years later. But I found my way there. I didn't have some man tell me That's to go there. It was a huge you could, difference. What you were good 100%. at. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. So, and so once you got in that back door at the Times, I'm going to stick mm -hmm. with that reference. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you educate yourself? Because now you're doing your own thing. Did you find a mentor? Were you researching other photographers? Um, talk a little bit about how you self grew and continued to learn and grow while you were creating your own opportunities. Was mentorship something that factored for well, you? Well, that started way before. And, and I never found a really, I never found a mentor, I have to say. And I'm sad about that. I, there wasn't the same push in the industry then that there is now for, there were very few women in the business, first of all. Um, and the ones that were, they were busy building their own careers. They, they, there wasn't this big push to like, you know, um, foster young talent. I feel like that's much more of a thing now. Um, there, it was a little bit more, it was really nineties, man. It was like a lot of, uh, you know, you have to learn how to laugh at the gross jokes or else you're uptight. You have to kind of get along and all that kind of stuff, but you could be, there, there weren't a ton of women to ask to mentor me. And some of the ones that I met were helpful and friendly, but not in any kind of like, you know, right, let yeah. me be your mentor kind of way. Mm -hmm. I had to make my own way. As for educating yourself, there is no excuse to not be doing that every single step of the way, all the way back before I, like when I first started working at the Daily in college, I would go to Detroit, Detroit for the weekends and go to photo shows. When I came to New York for the internship, um, I hooked up with the ICP, the International Center of Photography. Now that's a real school and you can take classes there and get a degree from there. At the time, it was more of just like they had exhibitions and all that. I went to an exhibition there by these twin brothers, the Turley brothers. They're both award-winning photojournalists. It turned out they had gone to University of Michigan and they had lived in my dormitory and they had been rejected twice from working at the same college paper that had hired me. And they went on to be multi-award winning photojournalists. They're really well known. I saw an exhibition of their work and it was mind blowing. They had gone to two different wars. One had been in like Sarajevo and the other had been in, I don't know, I think Afghanistan. And they had covered all this stuff and they did their, they, they put their work side by side. It was a fascinating exhibition with massive, massive prints. And it was beautiful. I spent all my free time at the Strand bookstore buying used um, photography books and and just reading about, you know, Diane Arbus. And so all these are things that I would have learned if I'd gone to photo school, but I didn't go to photo school. And you can, I'm not saying it's, you can replace your entire education, but if you're not going to photo, if you're not going to UCLA or USC for film school, there are other ways that you can educate yourself. You can find, and now, especially with the internet and with like online libraries and the, the criterion catalog and stuff like that, you could give yourself a film degree basically, um, or master class or whatever it is. Like there's there's a million things like that. Eventually that that comes into play with how I eventually made the switch to motion. I had always going back to my days at college, I had always um, loved working in photo stories where in, it, once a semester, everyone on the staff got an entire page of the paper to do a photo story. So instead of trying to tell a story in one photo, you are creating a photo story. It was a, you got to do the layout and pick the images and do the print and everything. And so that became what I really wanted to do. I eventually had the column in the New York Times, my life as a runway column, that's what it was. It was a full page of photos around a common theme um, very loosely based on this idea of um, basically cultural anthropology based, you know, as shown through your sartorial selections, the way people express themselves, the way they express what tribes they belong to, how they see themselves, um, you know, what they choose to do with their free time, who they are, everything expressed through their physicality. And we would travel all over and go to interesting things. We found weird groups of people, weird microcosms and and explored how those people uh, identify and differentiate themselves 
photographically in a page and a page of text. And that's basically what I was doing. I was making photo stories and I got to do it for the New York Times every other week for I think four years I had the column and it was wonderful. It was fulfilling and incredible. In fact, when it was done, I kind of went into a little bit of a slump. I was like, that was the height of my career. It's not ever gonna get better. It was amazing. I was a columnist for the New York Times. Um, and right around that same time, I met my now partner who was like a budding camera operator and cinematographer, and he was looking for stuff to film. And I was covering Fashion Week in you know three countries at that point and I had access to all the shows. And so sitting there at the bar one night on a napkin, I came up with the plot for a short film of, that involved, um, it was kind of funny, it was kind of tongue in cheek. It was based on the idea of like, you know, people say models don't eat anything. And it's like, well, what if there were these two eternal supermodels who never age and it's because they were surviving on eating brains and this is right when the vampire craze was going on everyone was all about vampires so i was like let's do something about zombies and this is before the zombie craze which is on now so we actually made this short film shooting gonzo style at fashion week we had this actor david dismulsion who's now like huge he's in um he was in ant-man and he's in um what is the 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 new harley quinn movie that he's in like that whole marvel world and he's right done, he's yeah. really yeah, wonderful character actor who's in a ton of stuff right now. He's the bad guy in one of the new ones coming out and he's hilarious. Um, and we met him at a casting for something else. And we were like, oh, you were that guy in Batman. You have such a great face. You wanna make this short film. And we shot it at night and backstage at fashion shows. And we broke into parties with our camera. And I, I asked everyone I knew, I had friends who were publicists who were throwing fashion events. And I say, can I get my fake supermodels on your runway? And can I get my actor to walk your red carpet? And we borrowed nightclubs that were not, you know, open during the day and shot there and all that kind of stuff. So I made this short film and got into the Seaches Film Festival, which is like a, it's a, how would you, it's like a genre it's film genre festival, right? Film festival. It's one of the top yes. in, the, in the world. So it's, if you have a movie that's any kind of horror or monster thing or whatever, oh, that's the festival to do. So we got it. Yes, exactly. So my first, my, the first thing I ever directed got into Seaches and I didn't, to be, to be honest, I didn't even know at the time that that was a big deal. I was like, oh, that's cool, you know. And we got a little write up in Italian Vogue because I was working for them and, and I wrote a thing about these models that we were working with. And so they did a blurb on it and it was great. It was so fun. And I was like, this is great. It's like, it's like a photo story brought to life, right? It's basically that same idea of telling a story in multiple images instead of in one. And that was the direction my brain was going in anyway. And I, I loved using parts of my brain and my education that I hadn't gotten to use as a photographer, like the depth of stuff I had read and just always wanting more. I always wanted more than just one image, you know? Um, That's so, so we started making stuff. Because so many photographers that I know that come from stills, it was Canon and the introduction in the DSLR that really helped a lot of um, people from the stills world move in. And it was fascinating to me how many people moved instead of becoming a DP, became directors because of DSLRs because they were so used to picking up and shooting. And that gave them power they never came from a space that they needed a DP to do something for them. And um, so it's really fun to hear another um, door to entry into the spark plug for your, your motion director. DSLR was the first digital camera that uh, Canon came out with that um, also did stills. And so it infiltrated an entire business um, of everybody that was working in stills because the camera could do both. And all of a sudden, a still photographer could also deliver video for their clients and explore and it looks, creative. It, it looks like a regular professional like camera. So camera. instead of like, instead of a instead of one of these huge cameraman things, yes, like you see the camera, yeah. camera that's what it that used to be. And then, affordable. so everybody, yeah. so any basic Canon, the 300s, the 500s, a lot of the cameras you guys are using now. Um, are some of those are still on the DSLR spectrum and really made everything accessible. And there was, there wasn't as much of a barrier to entry as learning the area, um, learning Panavision cameras. So it's really fun to hear right. that your spark plug came from a whole other way. It's really cool. And so when you connected the dots on, I want to do more of this film directing what steps did you take to teach yourself and then what steps did you take to make more more moving image so in my case um instead of 
I, I felt I felt a little intimidated to start and learn an entire new process of shooting in motion, but I had this interesting collaboration happening where I was partnering with, he's now my husband, who's my DP, and he wanted to make the motion and I wanted to tell the stories. And together, it was very like two parts two parts of a film, right? There's this, like, I'm always a stickler for the story. He'd be like, let's just go film something like oil and water and blah, blah. And I'm like, but what's the story? What's the motivation? Why? And that's the conversation that we're constantly still having. I, he wants everything to be beautiful and weird and different and interesting. A DP is a cinematographer. A, in film, they call it a director of photography. In stills, a director of photography is the boss of the photo department. But in motion, a director of photography is the cinematographer. They choose they and the director together, but they are picking the look. They choose the camera you're shooting on. They choose the lenses, but they also design the lighting. So if you're, if you see someone in a shaft of light, but it's dark all around them, or there's a pattern on the wall, that's all very deliberate. And they're designing all of that. They, they, they literally come up with the look of every single frame, every piece of light or dark, every um, the amount of compression of the lens, whether the lens is clean or grainy, whether you're shooting in slow motion, like all that kind of stuff goes through the DP. So in a, in film, a lot of what you see, the finished, the finished film, a lot of it is a collaboration between the department heads in general, art department and all that. But the DP is basically um, like literally in the olden days, they used to, not olden, I mean like 10 years ago, they used to literally decide what film stock you're shooting on, right? What kind of camera, all that sort of stuff. So in this case, it was really that collaboration that led me into the motion world. Like I had this person who already had this incredible ability to do visuals, to manipulate the camera um, and, and knew the ins and outs of the film cameras in a way that could make unbelievably gorgeous imagery out of whatever. And then I come in and I'm the person that's like, well, I, I want there to be a story. I want there to be character development. I want there, I want to know who these people are. They have to make sense to me. They have to have a motivation. Like even when we were just making fashion films for my existing clients, it'd be like, Jack, my partner would be like, if she climbs up on that hill and the, the wind and the light catch her in a certain way, it will be beautiful. And I'm like, great. Why is she climbing up on the hill? I need there to be a story. And so it's a constant push and pull of motion and story like and then and then as a director that's a big part of what you're doing you're taking a script that you have that you've either written or that you're you've worked with someone who's written it and you're taking the ultimate goal in the case of commercial directing you're taking the goal which is who is it who are they trying to reach as their audience what is their message and all that and you're taking that with the visuals and you're putting all of that together so you guys so going out on the weekend and shooting your own stuff you had the benefit of somebody who had their own gear so you guys had more freedom to just go shoot at that time well and and start. we were using we we're using everything we had like it, it, we didn't have really fancy cameras but if if jack had a job where he was renting a camera he would make sure to rent it on a friday and it wasn't due back until monday so as you said we'd have the weekend with this like hundred thousand dollar camera yeah. that we could never have afforded otherwise and then we would call everyone we knew and be like hey we want to make something so sometimes we'd have a client who was a fashion client of mine and i'd be like do you want to make a film do you want to make a motion version of your runway show or do you want to do this or we would you know, we would be like, hey, does anyone have a little script they've written? Or we signed up with groups like there's something called Zupa where they give you briefs and you can bid on the brief and you make it for no money, but it gives you inspiration and a story and all that stuff. And then if they like, if you win through votes and through the client liking it, then they'll give you $10,000 and you can keep it or you can, everyone just rolls it into the next project. Of course, it's all just an investment. So there are the, and now more than ever, now with Vimeo and staff picks and, um, there's a bazillion resources that didn't exist back then where you can find, you can actually connect with real brands. Instagram, there are people who have built their entire career on Instagram. I'm not one of them, but you can find a brand that's making stuff that you like and you can be like, hey, I want to make something. I've got a friend who is an actor or a friend who's a makeup artist or whatever and be like, if you send me a piece of product and lend it to me, I'll make something for you, send it back to you. If you like it, you pay me. If you don't, you don't have to, you know, whatever. There's a million different ways you can do it. The, the, you talked about the barriers with the DSLR. I think the last 10 years have been all about removing, there's always gonna be new barriers going up, but removing the barriers to entry. There are a million different ways into this industry. You would be willing to pivot, you have to be creative, you have to think, if, you, if you're like, I wanna be Martin Scorsese, great. So does everybody. Find something else that you do. If you also really like to 
design and sew, then make some crazy ass costumes and then go find, go, if you live in New York or LA, you can find, you can go to like MUD, there's a school called MUD, it's um, the makeup designers school. And the students that are there, they'll work on the weekends, they'll give you monster makeup for your I film. Your market, I, I don't want people, anyway. you know, beyond, the really cool thing about now is beyond New York and LA, there's so, be, between local theater, community college, um, cosmetology. I mean, those things are everywhere. And They're everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. It's, so that I love that you're talking about this, but I want to go back to your own personal. Once you kind of turn that light on and move the May, how did you learn? Did you find yourself watching movies in a different way? Did you find directors that inspired you and go the you know, the LA library has so many films now that are accessible through the program. Did you find like who turned you on and who became more creative it, or like guideposts, you know, how did you create your own process when you moved into, into what's a good film and what's my voice and, you know, what people can do, like, what did you well, do on, I um, to, to prepare? When I started on, when I started to move from stills into motion, I was already 35. So it wasn't like I was trying to be formed as an artist. It's more like I was trying to find a way to connect the pieces that were mm -hmm. already there. And uh, there are certain, there are certain things that I stumbled upon that were incredibly helpful. Like, you know, finding um, Alliance of Women Directors, once I moved to LA, that was one. And just realizing that there's, and that's everything from workshops to programs with NBC. They they they're, they keep you in touch with things like the Warner Project that you're doing. All of them is kind of new, but there were versions of it before. You know, there were these support groups and um, there, I'm, I'm hardly the first person to come from a non-film school background. Like I said, a lot of people come from editing and they were looking for ways to cross over. The thing I found that was the most specific and solid connection that moved me from where I was trying to go to sort of where I am now was hooking up with the commercial director's diversity program. And I'll tell you guys about that, but I will also tell you that there's a million other programs. Like it's not a big program. It only takes about five to seven people a year. So it's not gonna change the entire industry by itself, but it is part of this emerging group of programs that are coming from each studio, right? Like you, you're in Warner. And streamers. There's MC has one. Yeah, the streamers. I've, Netflix, Netflix has multiple different programs. I applied to one that was for diversity and inclusion and they really nice and they were big. Basically, like you have so much work in diversity, and we appreciate that. I actually, want to give this to somebody. I was like, great, fair enough. You know, I, this isn't for me. That's not the program for me. That's fine. So, but there are other ones like the commercial director's diversity was specifically for women and uh, traditionally disadvantaged disenfranchised groups. So, um, it was like, you know, sort of a mix of people who are women are not underrepresented in the world, but were radically underrepresented as commercial directors. I think 6% of the commercials last year were directed by women, which as I said in my application video, we're like 52% of the population and we're like 80% of the shopping public. So why are we only directing 6% of the commercials? It's not like I can only direct female products like tampons and diapers. First. But it's also no reason why a age white dude should be directing a tampon commercial. Like that's it, that stuff should be going to people who have skin and that. Guy. Now there's like all kinds of programs. That one was great for me. It connected me with a bunch of people in the industry who taught us very specifically what the process is for the commercial directing. It hooks us up with production companies. I met three different EPs that I now work with regularly through that program. It introduced us to actual people at advertising agencies and it introduced us to people like at Unilever, like the actual branded people. They would come and speak to us. They would connect with us. They would give us a chance to ask them questions. It, you know, I met, um, there was a woman that I met at that program who I didn't even know remembered me. And like four months ago, I got an email saying, hey, we want you to direct this Dove project for us. And I was like, great, how'd you find my info? And they're like, we sat in on one of your CDDP things two years ago. They just remembered me and they had kept it. And I was like, that's amazing. Like what a compliment, you know, it was incredible. Um, so fine, there, there are so many of those programs. This is a small one. A lot of people don't know about it. It happens to have its minimal funding from ICP. That is the, um, the ICP is like the commercial producers. Is it, I don't know, it's not really a union. It's like the group of like, you know, it's, they- It's an oversight. Think about it like an oversight guild and all legitimate production companies and it 
um, set standards, it sets standards. Yeah. Yeah. Set standards, guidelines, rates in different cities. Um, and it's a, it's a place also that producers collaborate about how to move the industry forward, how to, um, ethics with dealing with clients, ethics with dealing with yeah. agencies. Um, collectively, it also sets uh, crew with the unions too. Stuff with the unions yeah, and everything. And yeah, they're labor involved. relations and labor outreach and um, yeah. So for anybody that um, is, somebody asked earlier about how you set your prices and how rates are set, and the AICP has like the contract standards and they make the um, deal memos, like the standard documents that everybody uses. They kind of establish um, uh, and, and everybody kind of votes. There's a collaboration, there's boards. So, um, so as you are, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, as, we're, as you are teaching yourself, because you didn't stop and go back to film school, the biggest thing right. for you was working with on living live human beings and um, the uniqueness of the advertising is telling such a full story with very little dialogue sometimes and where, um, or if any at all, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you and how you got good at it? <laughs> how did you well, like kind of go through that journey of, you know, dealing with directing actors? Um, it was funny because most of the, a lot of the first projects I did, I wasn't directing actors. It, the, I was doing parallel things. I was doing fashion. So that's working with models, which I had already been doing. And that's, you're not going deep. You're, that's about how to tell a story, but your models are there to kind of do what you ask them to do and work collaboratively in that way. But it's not much deeper than that. And then on the other side, yes. And, 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 and choreography and stuff like that on the other side. I was, I was picking up more of my journalism background and I was doing documentary kind of stuff where I, and I still do this, where you're working a lot with real people. And it was funny because when I got started in commercials, it was, always, I always felt like, um, like real people stuff was kind of the, it was always the stuff that had smaller budgets. So it seemed to me like it was the kind of thing that was not valued in the industry. Like it wasn't as respected, but I was good at it and I enjoyed it. So I was doing more more and more of that. And then interestingly enough, as all these changes in the industry and, and in our culture have happened over the last five years, people are much more interested in that kind of stuff. Like you now have the big advertisers yeah. setting people up to, to work with real people. Like there's a lot of projects with, instead of like an actress who looks really fit playing a athlete, you're now doing something with a real athlete. So the fact that I've worked with tons of real athletes is a plus. Um, all of a sudden, uh, it became a huge pitching point that I work with real people. And it used to be like, it's a real people job. So it's a crappy budget. We have no time. The, it was like a throwaway. It's just so show. Now it's just a, all of those things that were asset. Yes. And also, frankly, now there's, there's no more, it's just social. Like they still try to undervalue that. But the fact is that is where people are consuming their information now. Like a social campaign is going to get seen by millions and millions of, it's so valuable. Right. You care and about it, those and numbers it, big time. A hundred percent. And, and like, think about it, think about how many more ads you see like when you're scrolling through Instagram in a day, than you do like sitting down to your network television but to me is, is exponential because I don't watch network television, except when I know I have a commercial airing, which is terrible to admit. But the fact is you have to be like, you have to be flexible and be honest about what you're good at and don't let other people undervalue that. Like if, if I, in my case, the industry came around to finding value in that, but I was doing it anyway, because I was interested in that. I, I, if you ask me what I want to do now, I want to break into episodic. Definitely. I want to keep making sure it's, I love doing the commercial stuff and giving it all a feminist slant and being like, I've, I've rewritten scripts before. Like the clients have come to me with a script. And I'm like, why can't that character be a woman? Why can't that character? Like, let's have that family be a mixed race family. That's much more realistic. Like I just did it for um, the Rockettes you know, the Christmas show and it comes out this week and we were supposed to go to New York and shoot like a, a, a typical family. And I was like, you gotta spend any time I lived there for 20 years. It's not a, I mean, it could be like, you know, a white 35 year old who looks like she's from Iowa and her hipster husband. I'm like, but it wouldn't be. So I cast the entire biracial family with a Latina grandmother and a 
mother and a black father and mixed race children. And you know what? They look like a real Brooklyn family and they're awesome. They're so, it, it, it makes the whole story. It looks like what I know Brooklyn families to look like, like use what you know. And, yeah. and you know, if you're, if you stick to your guns about stuff and you have a sense for that, you're the director. That's, that's the fun part. That's where you get to say, mm -hmm. I'm actually right about this. Trust me, and and be right. You sure. know, it's great. Agencies so, and and um, really have a very small circle of go-to people. It takes a long time to earn the trust of of agents who are gonna um back your play to their biggest brand. So you mentioned earlier that you've stayed freelance. So talk about. You know, if there's somebody out there that's just starting the freelance route, do you have any tips or things that you learned when you were first figuring out how to bid or how to find out where the jobs were? How did you start to build your body of clients or how did you get opportunity to even pitch on jobs um, without agent, without being at a shop? Well, the the, it was sort of different. Like the first things that we were doing before I was involved with the commercial director diversity program was sort of smaller budget projects, but starting exactly where we were going to our existing clients, you know, people that we knew like fashion companies I had done stuff for, or, you know, I, I even, I, I sold some ideas to the times. I was like, we're covering this as stills. You're building out your video coverage. Why don't you let us do a video version of life is a runway or, um, there were clients that I shot their fashion shows every season. And I was like, why are you using these same bozos that just shoot straight down the runway? So we got Jenny Packham, this British fashion designer, and she hired us, you know, to do her runway shows. And we did them really creatively with multiple cameras and different angles and blending backstage in with the, with the, the runway stuff. It was like much more interesting. And then we built out a team where we would churn that stuff out and we would have that up and running by the next morning, London time. We stayed up all night long with our editors cutting and making these things. Go to go to whoever you already know. You, uh, if you're if you're young, if you're a high school person, like see if your school will hire you to, you know, film a conference they're having or a special day senior day or you know whatever. Like watch everything you can watch, study everything you can study. Use you know weird camera angles. Try something different. Never stand back with your camera and wait for the action. Like get in there, do weird. Like learn editing. That's my biggest regret. You should learn editing if you can. You would become a better director across the board once you understand cuts and edits and stuff. Plus, it's incredibly powerful to be able to make your own stuff. You know, you just learn basic editing stuff. You can do amazing stuff on the new iPhones. Um, you can. I, I'm I'm just thinking like I know people who started out making. There are a lot. There are big big time directors who have houses on the beach in Malibu who started out with little cameras shooting their skate rat friends and they cut together skate rat videos and then vans would be like, hey, we're gonna sponsor you and give you some money for your skate rat video. And then, or other people who were involved in music and they started shooting people in their local music scene or they would go to local clubs and be like, hey, we'll shoot your, your 18 and under show and will you just post it online? So there's so much, I am not a huge person for, um, uh, social media marketing, like I don't know a lot about how to do it, but you can build an entire industry, getting followers on TikTok and Instagram and cutting together things. You can get sponsored. If you have, I think more than like 10,000 followers, you can start to partner with influencer companies that will get you paid to make the stuff that you're already making. Um, there's like, you know, the iPhone, com I think the iPhone now comes with built-in editing software that's excellent. Like get your friends to write a riff for you or, you know, you can, you can buy um, access to a music library. You can buy songs. You can buy a whole song to use across whatever you want for $10. Like that's a worthwhile investment. If you are a, like my, the company that walks my dog makes hilarious dog walking videos and posts them. And they've now gotten sponsored by a dog food company, you know, just the social media stuff has opened up this whole world where you can connect with advertisers who don't want to make a television commercial because that's not where their audience is. Their audience is also young people and that's not how young people are consuming anything anymore. So if you have an audience of five, 10, 15, 20,000 young people, and you're already making stuff that people like, you can connect with a brand that wants to reach those exact eyeballs. Yeah. Like you are the people that people want to advertise to you and your friends, you know? So, so talk, grab a camera, like, and it could be anything. Yeah. I'd love to talk about, um, so many, uh, people in, in any field of entertainment, in any busy field, navigating motherhood, 
and really demanding careers that take a lot of time, a lot of travel. Um, navigate how you have balanced that, what have been the challenges, um, and how you make it work. You know, when I started out. That is a whole, yeah. Yeah, when I started out, you, there were jobs I couldn't even get because I was of childbearing age and they were like, well, you could get pregnant, so we can't hire you, right? That was like a horror film company. Yeah, wouldn't hire me because, well, do you have, are you married? Do you have a boyfriend? You could get pregnant. So it's been really great to see how yeah. much has changed even since that happened to me in the early 90s. You know, things have changed fast and it's so great. Um, what have you learned yeah. about? Yeah, I mean, to do both. There are major. That's it. Well, having spent my whole life as a freelancer, um, I've never had any of like the the negative as I've never had any of the fallback things like paid maternity leave or any of that kind of stuff. However, the positive working in the arts, working in production is you set your own schedule um, and you're not really beholden to other people for that kind of stuff. It's, it's definitely something I'm still navigating. It's definitely new. There's a movement in, um, there's a movement in our industry to, for the major studios to provide childcare on at locations. I think Olivia Wilde is involved with that. She's, can you guys really It's a, it's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a, it's stuttering. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, you're coming back. I'm sorry. Try now. That's okay. Okay, good. Sorry. You know, yeah, um, one of the, about, I was just saying that I think I think the commercial world and a lot of my friends that work in it love it because the time frame is so comes um, it's intense, but it happens a lot faster. Feature filming, it could be six months out of town, and that's why commercials worked really well for them. Because and so, have you found that to you being able to stay freelance and control your own exactly? Space? We've lost her for a bit. I would love to, um, let me see if I can answer any more of these questions so we can get her back. Um, Sandy, I love, That's right. oh, Sandy so, oh, said, yeah. I is that Elizabeth? About the whole thing about, okay. So I'm gonna answer the thing about the, the time frame. Still working it out, especially because my partner is my DP. Okay, good. The, the worst case scenario is that when I'm busy, he's busy. So instead of me going off and doing my thing and having my partner take a turn with the kids, we're both gone for blocks of time, which is not great. The good thing is that because of this compressed timeline, I work really, really hard when I'm working. And in the two in the in the two weeks of shooting and pre pro, I'm I'm a little bit of an absentee mom. Like I check in in the morning and night, but I can't do the drop off and all that stuff. But then I wrap the commercial, and in the time leading up to the next one, I've got a solid amount of time where I can refresh my brain, start writing the new project, but then I'll spend time with my, you know, um, I have not done a film yet, but I know that's very different. Um, most women directors take their family with them. I think, um, I have not had to deal with that yet. It's, it's a problem that I'm looking forward to having one of these days. Hopefully by then my kids will be a little bit older and it won't be like abandoning them completely. Um, it's tough. There, there is this movement to have childcare provided in both in films. The studios are building childcare facilities. Like I think Olivia Wilde is involved in that because she has young kids and she is directing films. There are studios that are building nursery schools, daycares, early child centers on the like you know the big ones like the London huge one and you know the, some of the bigger studios in new york are talking about building little schools in there which frankly they should you know whether it's a woman director or a man director um, um and then in the commercial world there's a new movement where people are looking to um like basically put in a pay a child care stipend um i sort of consider that part of like the elevated rate that we make as directors and you know you ask for a rate that covers what you need and i sort of include that in there um but yes it's a it's an ongoing thing not just in commercial directing not just in film and television in every industry it's uh evolving people start to realize that we're not going to be put out to pasture when we have kids but we do need solid support so that we're not like abandoning our children to go to our job or having to choose between them yeah um so tell me so if that's that's a Super helpful. Yeah, absolutely. As you um, navigate, all, you know, the different stages of your life and, and 
uh, from being in sports and being a stringer all the way through motherhood, those things really impact our, our point of view in the world. How did you find your voice? How did you identify? You have a very strong aesthetic towards representation on screen. And so how, you know, how do you nurture that part of yourself that's constantly figuring out this is my voice. I'm, I'm not just emulating things I've seen in other people's expressions. You know, how, how do you nurture that artistic part of yourself and knowing that that's your voice and, the, you know, and building confidence in your creative choices and instincts. A lot of people feel like they have ideas or they have these compulsions, but they don't necessarily have the outside momentum telling them, yeah, do it, go, right? So um, that's, that can't be outside. That has to be internal. You have to feel the drive yourself because there will be things blocking you along the way. I will tell you that every director I know is struck by imposter complex at some point. You know, there are definitely times where I get to set and I look around and everyone's looking to me for answers and I'm like, holy crap, I'm in charge. You know, I have that same feeling with my kids. Sometimes I look around, and I'm like, oh, these kids, I'm their, I'm their mom. They're looking to me to have the answers. Oh my gosh. You know, um, every job you do, you will get more confident. Even the ones that go wrong, you'll learn something from them. For I, this is going to sound so cheesy and cliche, but figure out who you are as a person and that will inform who you are as a director. I, I'm lucky in that most of the projects I do, I'm able to, even if it's something that I'm not inherently interested in right off the bat, like the product, let's say, um, find a way to put some of yourself into the message or find yourself in, in the product and, and use your empathy and use what you know about yourself and, other people and truly connecting with it will make you better at your job. Um, I would say for me, I look at other people I'm, and I, I'm sort of who like crazy with designy things that are emotionally have nothing to do with emotion except for like the emotion of color or whatever, but it looks so cool. And I'm like, oh, why don't I make that? And it's, it's not me. It's, it's not my path. It's not myself. Like I look at it and I think it's beautiful and interesting and exciting and creative. And I'm like, I wish I was making stuff like that. And then I'm like, I look at what I'm making and I'm like, well, this is who I am. Like I'm making emotional content that people connect to that is all about empathy for the human experience. It's about, there's no good and bad guys. It's about people's real struggles in identity, in self-worth in all those things. And at the end of the day, that's a much more, that's much more clearly connected to who I am as a person. I, I like art and design and I wish in some ways that I was making multi-million dollar Apple spots where people are climbing on the walls and the walls are disappearing. And I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. I'll never get to make stuff like that. That's not who I am. Embrace who you are, be honest with yourself and find the, find work that you can speak to and that speaks to you that's the best you can do like you don't make yourself somebody else to be a different kind of director you're going to be the kind of director that you are or not director whatever you are if you are doing if you want to shoot shoot stuff that you're interested in and you'll find the people that are also interested in that and it will be interesting to them you can elevate it you can you can i mean i'm not saying just make what you already are that's boring keep learning keep growing keep making things better and better but the word that I make is a synthesis of all my parts in one way or another. It's like, how do it's you do that for yourself? Do you seek out certain filmmakers? Do you listen to certain music? How do you challenge yourself creatively? Um, constantly watching other people's work, um, keeping an eye on what other people are doing, mm -hmm. um, connecting with groups of other stuff like Alliance of Women Directors and stuff like that, going to screenings. Um, I watch a lot of stuff that I'm not particularly interested in because I know the person who made it and I'm supporting them. And then I end up always coming out of it with something amazing. You know, mm -hmm. I've gone to some tiny, tiny screening festivals and things like that. And people make a lot of stuff that is not at all what I would make. And it's, I'm like, that's not my style, but there's something you can get from it. I mean, that's true. Whether you're making film or whatever you're doing. I, one thing that I felt as an older person <laughs> looking at a younger generation is there's this big push towards, I gotta be me. And I respect that you 
should stay true to who you are and don't compromise your morals. But the flip side of I gotta be me is I don't take anything new in. I don't learn anything new. There's no other perspective that's worth it. It's all just me. Like what I, if I hurt your feelings, sorry, I gotta be me. If I did something that was kind of mean, I gotta be me. You do have to be you, but you also have to realize that there's a whole world around you and you can learn from it and you can improve from it and your world focus can get bigger. Um, I think it's important to always as a person, not as a director, as a person, keep exposing yourself to new things and new experiences and learning more. Um, and the best I can do as a director is to keep improving as a human being. And those two things go together. That's great. That's really great advice. I love it. Um, I wanted to save a little bit of time for us. Um, cause one of the things that, um, you grew, uh, is part of the many things that you do is unit photography. And it's just such a great career path that many people don't hear about. Uh, and I wanted to talk, if you share a little bit about what a unit photographer is and how that's a little bit different sure. from the other things and the roadmap to doing that. And then after that, I'd love to talk about how digital and the iPhone, that the phone has impacted the world of being a photographer mm -hmm. and kind of what do people starting out now need to, to do that's different? So if you could talk about unit photography first, that was super mm -hmm. good. So unit photography is basically like on set photography. It's the, it's um, on any television show or any film. It's a rule, I think of the union, but also of production and stuff that there is, that the photography comes from a, a unit photographer. It's a person who is credentialed, who is in the union. Um, and is allowed to be on set working and covering the scene. So any still you see from a film set or a TV show is shot by the unit photographer. Um, it's a very unsexy name for what's actually a really cool job. And it's only a small part of what I do, but you can 100% make a solid career out of it and it's fun. Um, you basically are, the the producers and the showrunners and the writers and stuff will get together. I think on a film, there's always someone. There's, I think my understanding yeah. is that on film is every day, right? It's the rule. It's the studio, because you have to deliver uh, as part of everything the studio, you have to turn in, you have to turn in a certain amount of publicity stills every day. And it's part of it also documents. And then on a TV show, it's not that they, Right. So you're doing both. You're shooting, you're shooting the stuff that's on camera, but you're also shooting the behind the scenes. Um, okay. And that's not TV, there are um, special days that are identified through the script that, that happen per episode. Yeah. Right. So they'll get together and they'll say, this is a day where we have a great guest star, or this is a day where we introduce a new set or a new character, yeah. or this would be a great day. And then I think on a show, it's usually like two to three days a week, something like that out of a yeah. show shoots five Our or six drama. days a week. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, you know, together over the course of the show, you're coming up with like an incredible visual archive of the creation of this show, of this season of the show. Um, they, there are people who do unit photography are in the local 600, which is the same union as the uh, cinematographers, camera operators and the entire camera department. So you're under the whole camera department thing. Um, if you got into that, you also get like union benefits. Like you can live a really nice life doing that. You could, you, if you want to get involved with films, you would travel around, you'd go on the set, on the location. Um, there's really fun stuff. I'm brought in to do some of the unusual stuff. Like the art department will have a day where they're trying out new costumes or new hair and makeup or new wardrobe, or, um, they're bringing someone in and trying something and, um, you get to shoot that kind of stuff. I, there are some days. Um, this is another thing that's changed rapidly. You used to have to have this giant camera housing to make your camera quiet and you had to buy them from this one place. This, this was another block to entry. It was really expensive to buy this thing. For some, it's different because you can use any kind of Sony or camera that shoots silently while they're shooting and you get so like they used to have to stop a film and let the still photographer go in and take like three pictures and then run out. And now you can kind of, if they'll let you that you can shoot while they're shooting, so it gives you a whole different amount of things to shoot. Um, they don't have to do a separate take for you. So it saves yeah. time. Um, you're compensated for your gear. You're paid for your gear and you're paid for your hours and you, you get like, you can pretty quickly accrue enough hours to get the full benefits and be in the union. And then there's the union has a ton of resources. Also, the union is, if you choose to get into it, and this is not just for camera stuff. If you happen to be interested in 
building sets. There's a set builders union. There's a costumers union. There's a there's a um, there's a hair and makeup union. Like these are all they set the rules. They set the hours. But you also get benefits. You get a pension. You can retire at fifty and still get. It's not like there's a lot of reasons to do it. Um, and uh, so the it's a great point that short film and independent films. Um, a lot of times they'll call it behind the scenes or BTS. So if you're looking to start building um, your portfolio by doing stills, find any short film that's happening, especially for those of us in LA, there's more film schools per square mile here. Find um, and everybody <laughs> and looks for crew. Um, sometimes I will follow casting notices and you can find a casting notice. And then you know that something's going into production. And if it's a short film or a low, it says low budget feature, then you can email. There's always an email you can find, um, or a lot of them have Facebook pages or Instagram about them getting ready to shoot. And you say, do you need a behind the scenes photographer? Um, and many times they do. And when you're start, first starting out, um, that's a way to build your uh, your portfolio, and then you can get on bigger things and start to qualify for the union. The really great thing about the local 600 is they have a membership director. Her name's Mary Lynn, and it's really easy to find out over the years, how long is it going to take you and what you need to do to then qualify for the union. And it gives you kind of a checklist. So as you start to build your career, you're making sure that you are including the type of work that will qualify you for the union. And you can do that through independent, independent productions. I would also series. say that if you want, I, and music videos, I think, right? Music videos will almost always want some sort of yeah, BTS shot for that. So certain ones. I think they but, count. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to get certain paperwork and make sure you're getting that paperwork. And then you add a certain amount of days, things like that. So it's a really um, great. And again, you don't need to buy a lot of gear like you used to in the past. A lot of those, um, uh, these new iPhones and stuff, right. I allow for BTS on low budget shows that I do. I'm perfectly fine. Those iPhone um, images satisfy everything that any of my clients need. So it's, it's, a, it's um, if you've got an eye and you feel like you can find the story that's happening in real time. You, like if you're, if you're either changing careers or you're up and coming in this career, a piece of advice I have for anyone who's either switching careers or starting into this there again, with like easy things that you can do that are now so much more available to people. If you want to do stills, build yourself an almost free website on Squarespace or any of those things and just get your things up there in categories, be like behind the scenes or band practice or portraits or on the street, whatever, make yourself categories, make yourself a website so you can always always refer to it. And if you want to do motion, get yourself a Vimeo account. You don't even need a pro account, but get a place where you can upload your videos, put your things up there. You can start communicating with people on Vimeo. I'm not very social on Vimeo. I use it more as like um, a warehouse for my work, but I have it categorized for myself so that if a client, if I know a client is looking for beauty or skin work or fashion or families or kids, I have it categorized like that and I can send them a link a direct link. This way you don't even need a production company to put you up for it. You can make your own reels on there. You can do a skaters or a teens or, you know, whatever, pick your, you can make yourself um, a very easy, like one link that pulls like, let's say five of your videos together. And you can send that out to people. You can meet somebody on a shoot and be like, Hey, do you mind checking out my work? And don't send them like a messy Vimeo page with everything on there. Send them, you can make little, um, what do they call them? They call them showcases. You can make them a showcase of like just the three things that are really relevant to what they were talking about. If you ask someone, will you check out my link? They will. I really think they will. Most people would be like, sure, keep it short, keep it tight. Just put your best stuff up there. But those are easy places. One for stills, one for motion where they're professional looking. People want to know that you take it seriously. It's you to pay like an annual thing, but I don't think it's a lot of money for a non-pro membership. And then you can constantly updating your work, putting stuff there. 
there are people who do all their business on Instagram. And I know that can be really successful for some people, but there's also anyone who's over 35 might still want to see one of these like slightly more professional ways of showcasing your work and they're not expensive. And again, you can do, you can do a lot of it with what you already have at home, like a small computer and home editing software. That's not professional. Um, like even just the, the iMovie, you can make all that stuff and then put it on Vimeo and then you have your own Vimeo place that you can share your work with whoever you need to share it with. That's fantastic. That's not a plug for Vimeo. I don't work for them. Right? <laughs> That's a fantastic advice. And there's others too. There's there's Frame IO and stuff like that. But Vimeo is pretty oh, universal at this point. Yes. Yeah, Vimeo is definitely the where everybody should start. I love that. So as right. we start to wrap this up, we want to um, talk about the future and talk about you know the the world. It's much different points of entry than when you and I started, and digital yeah. and um, the capacity, the photography capacity of a mobile phone has really changed mm -hmm. the game in so many great ways. So with that in mind, for those in the room that are moving into perhaps photography or moving image, um, internships and just going out and shoot takes on a whole new meaning. Go out and shoot something yeah. real now. So any yeah. final thoughts or tips um, as to some action items like on Monday, that um, would be your first steps if you had the tools that everybody has now? Well, I would say a couple of things. One, maybe you and I together or everyone else, including people who've put notes in here can come up with a bunch of websites that are great resources for people to, for this kind of stuff. Start reading those, subscribe to them, get their, get their, um, uh, get their, uh, you know, weekly updates that link to articles that will interest you. Um, definitely plan to make something. Um, write a silly story oh it's a, you can apply to like there's like one minute shorts and there's like thir there's 30 second films there's all this kind of stuff if you have an iphone even not a brand new one if you have an iphone you can make something download some editing software and learn how to use it the most basic kind I, that would be my advice to myself um and and start thinking what you can do to take what you already have and and make something out of it um if you have a, something weird going on in your life think about documenting it and putting it to music or or finding a way to make art out of it think about my advice to everyone is always write everything down but that's because i still read paper books i'm like turn pages but you know uh, outline a story think about what you can shoot um during the pandemic a lot of people got really good at writing um writing scripts that only involved two people in one room you know because that's that's what you have available. You can shoot something on an iPhone in your own home. We did, we made a whole short in my friend's garage and we applied to festivals and it went around and we did the entire thing in one garage. Um, and it was like a messy garage. We just shot the whole thing. We, I wrote it specifically to all take place in one room. Um, uh, get good at paying attention to what's going on in the industry, but also spend some time promoting yourself, build that basic, basic website, build that Vimeo page, make it look good. Um, talk to people, you know, think about anyone, you know, think about anyone you encounter in your daily life and asking them, can they connect you? Can they help you? And, 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 you know, don't be aggressive about it, but be like, Hey, I'm, I'm young. I'm interested in this. Do you have any advice? People love to be asked for advice. People love to talk about themselves. I've been talking about myself for an hour and a half. Like people will help you if you show interest in what they're doing you don't like if you, if you hear that your neighbor works at paramount don't be like hey can you get me a job at paramount be like hey what do you do what is your how does that tie in with this and that like you know pay attention to what people are doing and ask them about themselves and about their career paths and if they have advice for you um that's a really good one i have a friend who made a whole film about um how he was a doorman for years and he would always ask the famous people who came to his fancy hotel for one piece of filmmaking advice and he basically says he got a free education from like de niro and like every director who came to town he would just ask them that and they love to be asked you know and he wrote it all down it's an amazing document of free advice from the best film directors in the whole world you know ask people about themselves they will answer you ask them for help if they like you they'll probably help you um, and look into these groups. We're going to list about, is that Kimberly, do we have a way of reaching everyone? Like in a post and saying like, here's a, yeah. So the library, okay. Caroline will talk about it during the wrap up, 
of the the resource. Um, yeah, there's something that the library does after each of these sessions, and Caroline will speak to it. Yeah. Great. So we'll we'll make sure that we've listed. The, people are writing in. I can see briefly in the comments. People are writing in like other things that we should all be looking up that are educational or ways of connecting with other young filmmakers and stuff like that. Um, I would say that as for the future, it's super bright. The opportunities are coming. Like the dinosaurs are getting phased out, and a new generation is honestly taking over every part of this business in in ways that are ninety nine percent great. Um, the face of the industry is shifting. Some of it is lip service, but a lot of it is not. And the, you know, the people like you are storming the gates and demanded to be let in and it's happening. It's happening all around us. And I believe that there's better, more inclusive stories coming from people who had so many roadblocks before the roadblocks are being lifted or crashed down. And it's really exciting. It's a great time to be involved. There are a million different ways you can get involved. You could go into this thinking that you want to be a director and you could end up being like, an incredible scenic painter who spends their life traveling around building All incredible right. sets. Like each film employs thousands of people. Like there, they didn't all know where they were going to end up. Like ask around, get involved, check out if you could possibly get to a set. It's hard now because of COVID. It was definitely easier before, and it will be easier again later. People can just bring a plus one, or you can show up and watch the way. Like they shoot stuff on the streets. You're allowed to stand there and watch and watch what's happening and see if there's anyone who can tell you what's that guy doing or what what role is that guy? What does that gaffer do? Who's that guy moving that light? You know, you can ask. Like you can those things that are open to the public. You got to be across the street, but you can stand there and watch and you can see and don't get distracted by the movie star. Watch what the crew is doing. It's just as interesting. You know what I mean? Don't go ask Absolutely. for an autograph from Brad Pitt. Watch what the guy behind the camera is doing. much more exciting. It's really cool. Yeah, I love those ideas. Um, and I'll add a few as well, especially as COVID starts to abate. Um, there are still brick and mortar camera stores. Um, and going and volunteering once a day, many of those camera stores. And for those of you who live in LA, any film camera rental always has the need for interns, apprenticeships, and people who want to learn. And so never hesitate to go into um, a local film. If you go to productionhub.com, um, you'll see all the different vendors in Hollywood, in the LA County area, but not even just in Central, but out in the Valley, in Sun Valley, East LA, West Side, Sammy'sCamera.com is always a great first stop. Um, and never hesitate, if you're interested in learning, I guarantee you finding a mentor that will teach you is gonna be such an important part. Find people who are making stuff that really turns you on and reach out and, um, and, and, Many times we can create opportunity just for you to be in the room and apprentice and learn those tools. Panavision, uh, you could go all the way to Panavision and Aerie, but also there's so many local shops that are still brick and mortar here in LA. Um, uh, also, I really encourage you to, to reach, use your social media tools to reach out to people that you feel a real connection with and ask, don't ask for a lot, but almost everybody will answer one or two questions and, um, and make them count. Once you get to back after COVID kind of dials back a little bit, remember that a lot of television shoots here in Los Angeles and you can literally go and watch sitcoms tape, everything from Dr. Phil and Ellen. And, and um, like Elizabeth just said, Many times people go in those audiences to watch the show, but you also can see all of the behind, a significant part of the behind the scenes is happening right there. There also is an organization for you that are just starting out just to be able to get qualified to be on set to go for internships and PA jobs. Streetlights is here. It's near um, on Melrose near Western um, right off of the Paramount lot. And it's a training program for people that are under resourced to learn how to be a professional person on set. And it's a great gateway. It will train you and then they help you staff and get your start both in commercials and television and feature film. I really recommend that as an entry point for many of you. 
um, that are thinking about starting out and, and developing a career. So, um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time, for sharing so much in your own personal journey. It's such a unique uh, entry way, and I think it's really inspiring that where how you came through. So, I know a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah, great tips today. Thank you. I've, I'm so honored to be asked and I'm glad this worked out. I'm so happy that Sky asked me to join you guys and um, you're, you're welcome to share my um, contact info for anyone who has questions directly. I'm happy to talk to people. Fantastic. Um, tell everybody your website and your Instagram. Oh, my Instagram is Liz Lip Photo. That's L-I-Z-L-I-P-P-P-H-O-T-O. Yes, I know that's three P's in a row. I wasn't thinking about it at the time. And um, my website is elizabethlipman.com. There's a whole, there, it opens up to my directing work, but then there's a whole photography thing on there. So you can kind of see the way the two sides of my brain work and the way they connect and the way they're separate. Um, and at, oh yeah, you can actually reach my email directly through there. So happy to answer questions, anyone who wants to follow up. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody once again for coming to another amazing session here at the LA Library. We thank you for your time and thank you for all your wonderful questions and we're gonna hand it back over to Caroline. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. And thank, thank you. the Calabasas yes. Library for us for hosting you. <laughs> I will. It's very lovely here. It's very nice. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kimberly and Elizabeth. Tons of amazing tips um, about how to get into this work. And so um, it was so interesting to hear. I'm so grateful to have the both of you and all of your knowledge with us today. And thank you to everyone in the chat too. I love the community we created, you know, sharing resources with each other. Um, I know not everyone can see um, each other's chat. So we're gonna put all the resources that Kimberly and Elizabeth mentioned today as well as the ones that folks shared in the chat and then more um, and stuff we have at the library too, online learning, um, laptop, laptop and hotspot loans, um, canopy films, all that stuff. Um, we'll share that in a resource document and email it to everybody who registered along with a link to this recording. So you won't have to miss a single thing. Um, our next Creative Careers panel is event is on Saturday, October 23rd, same time, 11 a.m. Um, and this one will feature about video game production from folks from Warner Brothers games. And so we are very excited for as the series continues and we're still scheduling out more events like this in the future. And we would love to hear from you on what you would like to learn from this series, what kinds of professions you wanna see or curious about learning, what kind of questions you have that you want answered. So please share them with us. When I email all of you the resources, feel free to respond with any kind of ideas or things you wanna explore. Um, and if you're interested in more of our upcoming virtual programs and all kinds of topics, please visit us at lacountylibrary.org um, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us.